morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Don Piscala. I'm a professor in the politics department here at San Anselm. And uh, this course is called Public Policy Process. <coughs> and uh, without further ado, uh, it's our custom here at San Anselm to uh, have one of our students introduce our guest for the day, uh, whom we're very happy to have. And uh, our introducer today is Lindsay Hansen. She is uh, a junior politics major from Plymouth, New Hampshire. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to our public policy class. Uh, we have a special guest this morning, Senator John Edwards. Uh, John Edwards is a freshman senator from North Carolina and was first elected in November of 1998. Uh, since elected, Senator Edwards was the chief sponsor of the Bipartisan Patient Protection Act. Uh, he has made major investment in American public schools, has supported strong anti-terrorism measures, assisted in modernizing the nation's banking system, and focused on campaign finance reform and legislation to fight corporate corruption. He holds a seat in the following committees, Health, Education, Labor and Pension, Intelligence, Judiciary, and Small Business. Senator Edwards has emerged as a champion for issues affecting the daily lives of people in North Carolina and around the nation. Last month, the Senator announced that he will be campaigning for the Democratic nomination. Um, on behalf of myself uh, and everyone at San Anselm College, we welcome you, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Now they'll be a test for every one of you on which committees I'm on. <laughs> you all got there, right? <laughs> uh, thank you. It's great to be here with you. And uh, one of the things I always notice when I come to New Hampshire is I seem to be the only person in the room with no accent. Have you all noticed the same thing? Uh, it's, it's a privilege to be with you. Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, why I'm running for president and what I think my responsibility is as a candidate for president. I think I have a responsibility to give the American people a clear choice in 2004. Um, uh, we have um, an important presidential election coming up, I think a turning point really for the country in many ways. And what I think my responsibility is, is to show the people of, of this country and the people of New Hampshire, because you all are so important. Some of you, I guess, are from Massachusetts too, people in this class from Massachusetts. Uh, you're very important too. Uh, this is what the, this is what choice I will give people in this country. First, somebody who comes from them. You know, I grew up in a small town in North Carolina. I was the first person in my family to go to college. Uh, I worked my way through college and law school. I spent 20 years as a lawyer, representing the same people I had grown up with. People like uh, my own father. He and the people who worked in the mill with him. Uh, they were, for me, uh, uh, they are for me, most of America. You know, I, I think it's a good and noble thing to fight for people who can't fight for themselves, which is what I think I did as a lawyer. Uh, and then I ran for the Senate for the same reason, to give, give uh, the people I've grown up with, people like my own father, uh, a voice on the floor of the United States Senate. They are the reason I'm running for president. People like my family, the people that I grew up with, the only hope they have, because my, I promise you my father's not a member of any group, he's not got any lobbyists in Washington, D.C. The people who worked in the mill with my dad, they have nobody uh, lobbying for them in Washington. The only hope they have is that their president will go into the White House every single day with ideas and vision about how to make their lives better. And with some backbone and courage to fight against anything that gets in the way. And that's what this is about for me at the end of the day. Uh, now, that's compared with the president we have now who comes from a very different place and as a result has a very different perspective. You know, you all know his history. Uh, among other things, his, his father was president of the United States. Now, I always like to tell people we still believe in America that the son of a mill worker can uh, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the uh, son of a president for the White House. And I, I believe that. I think that's part of, uh, uh, part of the American dream. But what concerns me about the way President Bush runs the country is that he's got a small group of people, who, a small group of insiders, who seem to run the country mostly for insiders. <coughs> they tend to believe in government like this, looking down on the rest of us. You know, they'll tell us what what they think we need to know when they think we need to know it. Um, 
Well, that's not the kind of America I believe in. It's not the kind of government and leadership that I believe in. And I would say that I don't think this is an accident. I think it is a direct function of President Bush's own life experience. I've told you about mine and my perspective. President, these folks that, that are this group of insiders, they are responsible in large part for the president being elected governor of Texas. Uh, they're largely responsible for him being elected president. Uh, and I don't think he's forgotten it. And I don't think he will ever forget it. And it shows. It, if it were just an abstract thing, that'd be one thing. But it's not abstract. It really has an enormous effect on people's lives. Um, we, uh, the Patients' Bill of Rights, Patient Protection Act, uh, that Senator McCain, Senator Kennedy, and I wrote in the United States Senate. It was basically the idea was that families and uh, ought to be able to make their own health care decisions. Those decisions shouldn't be made by bureaucrats working for HMOs and insurance companies. Uh, families in consultation with the doctors. We got a great vote in the United States Senate, but it is not the law of the country today. Why? Because the President has fought us every step of the way trying to get this Patients' Bill of Rights signed into law. Uh, he is unable to say no to his friends at the HMOs <coughs> in the insurance industry. The same thing happened when we tried to bring down the cost of prescription drugs. Senator McCain, Senator Schumer, myself, and some others uh, worked on a piece of legislation that was basically aimed at closing some legal loopholes that were being used by the pharmaceutical industry to keep generic drugs out of the marketplace. And the result was that the prices that the uh, pharmaceutical companies kept their monopoly, no competition, and the prices stayed up. Well, it was obvious that these loopholes needed to be closed. We got 70-something votes on the floor of the Senate on our legislation. But it is not the law. Why? Because the President has not been able to say no to his friends in the pharmaceutical industry. Now, I don't have a quarrel with the pharmaceutical industry. I think they do a lot of wonderful things. They can have a really positive effect on health care, both here and around the world. But the reality is, in this case, they were wrong. And we have to have somebody in the White House who's willing to stand up to them uh, when they are wrong, and they were wrong in this case. About two and a half, three weeks ago, I had an amendment on the floor of the Senate to try to stop the President from changing our clean air laws. Now, the, what, the way this was being done is, you know, some legislation goes through the Congress, is debated on the floor of the Senate and on the floor of the House and voted on. Uh, then there are changes that the administration, the President, can make himself just by changing the rules uh, without having to go through the Congress. Well, they were doing this through rulemaking. They didn't have to go through the Congress. And what they were doing, if I can put this in stark terms, uh, I believe will put children, young people, uh, at risk for having severe asthma attacks, thousands of young people, all over the country because of the impact it's going to have on our air. Uh, senior citizens who have respiratory problems will literally, I believe, their lives will be at risk. Uh, so why would the President want to change the laws that have protected our environment, have protected our air, the air that all of us breathe, uh, for the last quarter century because the energy industry, the oil companies, are for it. And he cannot say no to his friends. Uh, and then we have, if you, if you followed his economic proposal, I mean, the President's made a proposal that he, he says will stimulate the economy. Um, the problem with his proposal, though, is almost a huge portion of the benefits go to people at the top of the income spectrum. And not nearly enough goes to the rest of the country. Now, I think there are things that we should do to get the economy going. I, I myself think we need to provide some help to the states. You know, we have state budgets, including this state budget, New Hampshire's budget, that are struggling mightily. Um, that's happening all over the country. The federal government should provide help to the states with their budgets. I think at least $50 billion. Uh, which I think could have a real impact. We have uh, families all over America who are, who, uh, are having increased energy costs this, uh, this winter. And I think we ought to do a $500 uh, tax credit, refundable tax credit to families so that they can get some help with their uh, increased energy costs. Uh, I also think we ought to make sure that we extend unemployment uh, coverage for those people who've lost, a jo lost their jobs through no fault of their own. And we want to also provide some incentive to businesses to buy things 
they otherwise might put off buying. Uh, so I've got a, a tax write-off that uh, gives some incentive to businesses to make purchases they otherwise wouldn't make. But the whole idea of all this is to get money into the economy, get the economy going now. But for that to work, it has to be done in the context of making sure we're operating the federal government in a responsible way over the long term. See, I believe that the budget for the federal government should be run much like your family budget is run. You know, we ought to have balanced budgets. We ought to not spend money we don't have. We shouldn't have tax cuts that we can't, can't afford. I think that's just the responsible thing to do. So I think we need to get back. The president's driving us deeper and deeper into what's called deficit spending, which means we're borrowing money to pay uh, for what we're spending today. Uh, I think that's a mistake, and I think that you will pay the price for that. Uh, I think young people, uh, my own grandchildren, will pay the price for what's happening right now. Uh, because there, there, is a, there is a debt, and it will be paid by somebody. Uh, and I think it's irresponsible to keep going deeper and deeper in the deficit, which is what's happening now. Uh, so what I would do is I would make some changes in our current course. I would first stop the part of the President's tax cut that's scheduled to go into effect next year. Uh, for people just at the very top of the income spectrum. I'd make the rest of the tax cuts uh, permanent. In other words, make them available. I think we do need tax cuts in America. Uh, and in addition to that, I would reduce the size of the federal Washington bureaucracy because I think it can be cut and we can cut spending on that side. So we make some changes on the spending side, make some changes on, on the tax cut side, and try to get back to the place that we're not having to borrow and borrow and borrow uh, a debt that I think you'll be ultimately responsible for. Uh, and that we run the government in a responsible way. Because uh, I think that's the way to deal with the economic problems we're having. It's also a way, the way to lift up all of America, not just a few, but everybody, uh, which I think is the key to, to having real economic growth in America. Um, another issue that, that concerns me with this president and I hope we get a chance to talk about this some more, all of us, is I serve on the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I worry that some of the President's uh, judicial nominees are ideologically uh, positioned so that they will not vigorously enforce some laws, national federal laws, that I think are critical uh, for us to continue moving forward in the country. For example, our civil rights laws. Uh, having grown up in the South, with the civil rights movement, uh, it's personal for me. I mean, it is really important to me that we keep making progress, that we keep moving forward. We still live in a country where African Americans make roughly half of what white Americans make, uh, income-wise. Uh, Hispanic Americans have, have exactly the same problems. Uh, and we have work to do. I mean, we have important work to do. But to do that, we're going to have to have judges that are willing to enforce our civil rights laws and willing to enforce them vigorously. I also believe the President is wrong about uh, uh, the Affirmative Action Program at the University of Michigan. You know, I, I, I was raised in a little town out in the country in North Carolina, about 800 people. And I was brought up to believe in an America where we embrace everybody. You know, no matter who your family is, uh, where you live, what the color of your skin is, and we still have, I have seen it up close and personal, we still have people today who every minute of their lives suffer the effects of discrimination. And I think we have a responsibility to lift those people up. And I also have believed that diversity in, uh, in student bodies, whether they be high school student bodies or, or uh, university and college student bodies, is a very positive thing. I think it's a good thing. So, I think we have important work. We also have important work to do on equal rights, not just civil rights. Uh, you know, women in America today uh, are often paid 73 cents on the dollar for doing work equivalent to work being done by men. You know, I believe that we need to do something about pay equity in America. It is inexcusable for women who are doing the same kind of work not to be making the same kind of uh, income. So, I, those are the things that I believe we have to focus on here. Uh, to try to, to restore people's belief in their country and in their government, give control of the government back uh, to the American people instead of a small group of insiders. I also think we have really important work to do 
about America's role in the world. Now, let me start by saying everybody's been watching television and, and, uh, uh, and reading the newspaper about the potential war in Iraq. Uh, many of you may disagree with me about this. Uh, this is not, it wouldn't be unusual. I, I feel very strongly that Saddam Hussein is actually a, a very serious threat. Uh, he does have chemical and biological weapons. He's doing everything in his power to get nuclear capability. And I think it's, the threat has to be dealt with. He must be disarmed. Uh, and if he doesn't disarm voluntarily, I think we should be willing to use force to disarm him. Uh, having said all that, uh, the President's policy in general around the world uh, concerns me. Uh, it concerns me greatly because I worry about you living in a world where generation after generation of people hate us. I think it is so important that we change course. And uh, the one thing that I'm certain of is we should maintain our strength. You know, our military strength, our economic strength, we are the world's superpower. We should stay there. But we should use that strength to, to uh, promote our values, the things that we care about, like democracy, freedom, and human rights. Um, but we also, and this is critical, we should lead in a way that creates respect for us, respect for America, not in a way that drives others away. And having visited over the last year or so some of these areas of the world, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Europe, uh, I can tell you the world is watching us very, very closely. Uh, I mean, they, are, they watched to see in Afghanistan once we got rid of the Taliban how serious we were about allowing the Afghan people some chance of having success. Uh, they will watch if Saddam is gone in Iraq to see whether we're serious about allowing uh, the Iraqi people some chance of success. Uh, I'm pleased that the President's now talking about the AIDS crisis in Africa. I hope he's serious about that. That's good. Uh, but what the, and I, I was in Europe recently. I, the European friends, they just want us to talk to them and treat them with a little respect. Uh, but. What, this is what the world is watching for. They're looking to see whether they believe we care about their peace and their prosperity or just ours. That's what they're looking for. And I would say to all of you and to every family in America that your family is safer in a world where America is looked up to and respected uh, than in a world where America is hated. And Many of you know this, you know, one day or very long ago that we used to be this great light on top of the hill that everyone looked up to. Well, that's changed. Uh, but we can go back to that place. I believe that to get there, we're going to have to have different leadership in the White House. And that's one of the reasons that I'm running for president. And, and finally, I just want to say one thing to you, uh, which is it is so important that you be involved and engaged. Now, you have a wonderful opportunity going to school where you are. Uh, New Hampshire is one of the most critical places in deciding who uh, the Democratic nominee this time, the Republican nominee and the Democratic nominee last time uh, for president will be. You need to be engaged. I mean, you ought to have a voice in shaping the future of your country. This is your country, and we need you. I'll speak for myself. I need you. Because one of the things I have learned in going to colleges and universities around the country is you have an energy and a passion that, that cannot be matched anyplace else. Uh, you have a set of ideas that are original, that are outside the box. You know that, that crowd in Washington, including me, uh, we sometimes tend to think like this. You know, we think in a linear way. We don't think outside the box. And you have something to add uh, to this discussion and the national debate. And it is really important for people like me to come uh, to classes like this, to the universities, to the colleges, uh, and to the high schools for that matter, uh, and listen to young people and hear what you're thinking, hear what you're concerned about, and to pay attention to what you're saying. So that's one of the reasons I'm here today. I, I, I want to hear what you're concerned about. I want to hear what, what, you, what you think we ought to be doing as a nation, because you should be involved. We need you involved. The national debate needs you, our country needs you, and being a little more selfish and personal, I need you. Uh, 
because you can add enormously to what we're doing. So it's an honor to be here with you. Uh, and I'd be happy to take questions, comments from any of you. Um, I encourage them. Come on. I can see you guys trying to wake up, but we're going to have to uh, have to start talking. So who has a question or a comment to start? Come on, guys. Come on. Somebody must want to ask something. You want to ask about education? You want to ask about uh, the war? You want to ask about, yes? Um, Mr. Senator, I understand you're a strong supporter of uh, public school education. I yes. was wondering what what you uh, what's your position on private vouchers for education? Uh, I don't support vouchers. And the reason is because I, I worry that they drain resources that we need in the public school system. Um, I do have also some ideas about what we ought to do with our public schools. And I have a program, which I probably should mention, called College for Everyone, uh, to allow people who are choosing not to go to college, who should go to college, or qualify to go to college, uh, access to college, but they're not going because of rising tuition costs and they can't afford it. They don't quite understand how they apply for financial aid and what they're supposed to do. The notion of that is, I'll do that quickly, is basically that if you're willing to do college prep in high school and you're willing to work 10 hours a week, your first year of college, we will let you go uh, to a, uh, a state university or a community college tuition free uh, the first year to get kids into college who otherwise might choose not to go because they're worried about the cost and worried about it about being there. Um, on, the, on the issue of, of public schools, I, I think that we still have two school systems in America in many ways. You know, they're not race-based anymore because of the Brown versus Board of Education, but I think they are based on economic conditions and uh, they do have racial implications. Uh, and I think we have to address this problem in a serious way. Uh, we need to help teachers. We need, I think having a good teacher, a highly qualified, motivated teacher, at the front of every classroom is the single best way uh, to impact that. So I have a, a series of proposals to get a qualified good teacher in front of every classroom, including providing incentive for teachers to go places they may not want to go. Uh, I mean, there are some places that are it's harder to teach, you know, especially when the kids come from chronically disadvantaged families. Uh, and those are often the places we need the best teachers the worst. Uh, so I think we ought to provide some incentive to get teachers to those to those places. I also think we can have a real impact with early childhood programs. You know, that's the time when we can have the most impact on young people. Um, we, in North Carolina, we, uh, Governor Hunt started something called uh, Smart Start, and it's been enormously successful. And the whole notion is to make sure that all kids get off to a good start. Uh, so we get, get young people when they're uh, uh, most susceptible to positive influence. So those are, those are some of my ideas about, about public schools. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Um, you just mentioned for in your college for everyone policy yes. that um, if the incentives sound really good, like college prep and, and whatnot, but how will they pay for it after their, their first year? It's a perfectly good question. The, here's the idea. Uh, we were trying to not have it cost so much that it became cost prohibitive. You know, because if you, I mean, what you'd like to do is say to these young people, we're going to take care of you your whole four years of college. The problem is the cost goes through the roof when you do that. So the idea is you have a lot of, of kids, particularly kids who uh, are from disadvantaged families, who don't know what they're supposed to do. You all been through this. You know, you've seen it yourself. You know, when you're a junior and senior in college, you're not, and you don't have the money, and you're not quite sure what you're supposed to do to apply for financial aid or to apply for these loan programs. Uh, so what the, here, the idea is this. We want to take those young people who are qualified and ought, should be in college and who are willing to work, to show their commitment by being willing to work. Get them to college, get them in their first year, show them that it's a good thing, they should be there, they can learn, and then they, they can find out while they're at college, or at the university, what programs are available to them to help them pay for the remaining three years. That's the idea. I mean, in, in, the, in the perfect world, we pay for all four years, but then it becomes, uh, it becomes too expensive, that's the problem. I mean, what I'm suggesting, uh, ends up costing a net of about $3 billion a year. Uh, if we were to pay for all four years, the cost goes up dramatically. That's the reason for it. But that's, the idea is to get them there. Get them there, get them involved, get them engaged, and then they'll know what programs are available to them. Would it include also like um, showing them how to do scholarships? Because most scholarships are primarily based in high school, not necessarily in college. 
college, like applying for them and whatnot. That's true, but there are, as you know, there are also scholarships that are available to kids who are already in college and are, are in the middle of their uh, of their college education. Oh, it, 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 the whole program is designed to get them to college and get them the help they need uh, and for them to see because, you know, it's, it's so easy, it's such a natural break point psychologically between high school and college for them to say, all right, it costs too much, I don't have the money, my family at home is not pushing me to go to college, so why don't I just go to work? And they end up never going to college. So the idea is you want these young people to get to college, start learning, and learn what programs are available to them, all financial aid programs, including, we hope, some scholarship programs. Yes. Mr. Simon, I'm just curious, how do you feel um, the current Bush administration, I mean, the way they're dealing with North Korea, do you think that they should uh, step up uh, action on this, or is there anything you would do differently? Well, I, let me start with what I would have done differently, and then I'll tell you what, what I would do now. Uh, I think that what happened in North Korea, can you all hear the question? You need me to repeat, he's asking about North Korea, how, what I thought about what the Bush administration had done in North Korea and what I would do differently. Um, I think the, they've made a number of mistakes. And at first, when they came into office, uh, we were engaged with the North Koreans in making progress uh, in a positive direction. Um, what's happened since then is we've had a lot of fits and starts and a lot of inconsistency in how we dealt with North Korea, particularly being engaged with them. At the same time, we've also taken another number of steps which alienated, uh, we first embarrassed the South Korean leadership. Uh, we've in many ways alienated the South Korean people. If you watch the news reports, there is enormous anti-American sentiment in South Korea now. Uh, so that, since, since it's so pivotal to us being successful with North, dealing with North Korea, that relationship needs to be rehabilitated. We need to get, our relationship with South Korea needs to be improved and improved dramatically. Um, the other thing, which the administration has been doing uh, to some extent, is we need partners in dealing with North Korea. We don't want to be doing this by ourselves, uh, particularly Japan and Russia and uh, uh, China. And the administration has actually been working on that. I agree with them that diplomacy makes sense in North Korea. You know, the la last thing we want is to isolate the North Koreans. And unlike Iraq, we don't have a decade of failed diplomacy. And this is a place where uh, where I think diplomacy can do some good. So I think we, uh, some of the things they're doing are the right things. I think they help put us in a bad place uh, to begin with. But uh, I think engagement with the North Koreans and, uh, uh, and being willing to negotiate with them at this point is, is the right policy. I think it's the right way to deal. And particularly to bring down, the ratchet down the, uh, the, the rhetoric, which I think is dangerous. Sure. The U.S. and South Korea have joint military exercises uh, coming up. Yeah. Do you think that will escalate anything? Do you think we should continue? No, I don't. We have to. I mean, I think I think the North Koreans have to have to take us seriously. They have to believe. See, I would not take a military option off the table. Uh, I mean, I think that would be a mistake. We need all the tools in the toolbox to deal with this problem. But I think, and so as a result, I think we should go forward with those exercises. To answer your question, but. Uh, I think at the end of the day, the great likelihood is that we can be successful. As long as we're tough, uh, as long as we have an international coalition with us, uh, that we can be successful in dealing with the, uh, what I think is a crisis in, in North Korea. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned earlier how uh, a lot of the states are question is about uh, special ed funding and the fact that the, the states are having trouble paying for special ed. Well, um, I do two things. I do two things. First, uh, I'm on the education committee in the Senate. 
one of the things that we had a great debate about when we were uh, uh, doing the No Child Left Behind legislation that the President was proposing was how much we were going to increase funding for special education. The federal government has never, as you said, just pointed out, never met its obligation uh, that, we're, that we're legally required to meet of fully funding our share of special education. The result is that state, and that, for example, for example, both here in New Hampshire and in Massachusetts, would have an enormous impact on, uh, on the budget situation, particularly as, as it deals with education. Like we've had, they've had a, uh, here in New Hampshire, they've had an uh, education funding crisis almost. Uh, and a huge part of that would be eliminated if the federal government did its part in, in uh, funding special education. So the first thing I would do is ratchet up dramatically the, uh, the federal government's uh, uh, meeting its obligation to, uh, uh, if we're going to have a mandate, we ought to meet our responsibility to help pay for it, is the bottom line. Uh, but I think also, when I mentioned earlier doing help for the states in general, the $50 billion uh, to the states, that since, uh, since states' budgets are, are struggling and a huge part of every state budget is, or most state budgets, is, is public education, that help will also indirectly have a, a positive effect on, on exactly the problem that, that you're talking about. So I think those are the two ways I would, I would deal with that, that issue. And it is a problem. You're absolutely right. It's a, it's a significant problem. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, you're talking about giving money to states to like, help their budget. Yes. Um, did you have any guidelines as far as like, how they were going to use that? Or was it completely up to the states to decide um, where they were going to use that extra money? The answer is we would have some guidelines for part of it. Uh, some of it, for example, I would want to see go to um, Homeland Defense to help with people who would be the first responders on Homeland Defense, police, firefighters, EMTs. One of the things that's happening is when state budgets, not just state budgets, by the way, municipal budgets, city budgets, county budgets uh, are all struggling. And the result of that is they're have not able to pay for the people who'd be really on the first front line if there were a terrorist attack. And uh, so we want to make sure some of the money goes for that purpose. And then we'd leave uh, uh, also another significant chunk of it that would be discretionary. We'd let the states and the municipalities uh, decide what, they, what their most urgent needs were to answer, to answer your question. Uh, I do think that, you know, you, you all have probably seen on television and, and read in the newspaper this whole reorganization of the federal government on homeland defense and, and uh, creating this new uh, agency, uh, the Department of Homeland Defense. One of the things I worry about is while we're rearranging all these bureaucracies in Washington, whether we're doing what we ought to be doing out around the country to make sure that people are safe. I mean, most places, if you go most places in the country and say, and ask this question, what would you do today different than what you would have done on 911 if a terrorist attack occurred in your community or nearby? Most people have no idea. No idea. You know, and if an attack occurred in the middle of the night, do they have a way of finding out? I mean, do we have any kind of comprehensive warning system nationally? Uh, you know, because you're not in the middle of the night, your television's not going to be on, or at least most people's television won't be on. Uh, your radio's not going to be on. So we have to find some way to warn people. We have to make sure people know what they're supposed to do. Uh, I mean, there's lots of work still to be done uh, for us to deal with the whole issue of, of terrorism. You know, in our ports, we have these huge containers coming in some of them about half the size, you've seen them about half the size of this room. And something like 10% of them get inspected by anybody. So just think about that. Now, that means somebody who's trying to send some, something dangerous into the United States has a 90% chance of getting it in. Uh, and we're just not doing the work we need to do. We're not, do it, we're not adequately protecting our nuclear plants, our chemical plants, our most vulnerable targets. Uh, I mean, there's a lot. Uh, to be done. I also think that we need somebody else other than the FBI to be responsible for terrorism here in this country. Uh, we've had real problems with the FBI. The FBI is a great law enforcement agency. They're great at finding criminals, arresting them, but they're not as good and they've been uh, done a poor job in the past of intelligence, you know, identifying uh, terrorist cells, monitoring them, infiltrating them, finding out what's going on. Uh, I, would, I would take that job away from and create a different agency that was solely responsible for fighting terrorism 
uh, in conducting intelligence here, here in this country. So the bottom line is I think there is a lot we can still do on the issue of, of, uh, of homeland defense in general. Yes, sir. You've been like just now quoted saying you want to create a new agency for combating terrorism, but you've also said a couple of times that you're trying to reduce the federal bureaucracy. How, in this case, would adding a whole other agency alleviate the problem? That's, that's, that's actually a very good question. Here, what what we will do is this: we will take the same responsibilities that the FBI now has and just shift it. In other words, we're not going to have we're not going to have new people. We're not going to have new power. We're just going to, there's an inherent problem within the FBI that doesn't exist within the CIA. I mean, you know, the CIA does our intelligence overseas, but they don't do law enforcement. And what happens is the FBI hires people for the purpose of law enforcement. What they're trained to do is to catch criminals, indict them, arrest them, indict them, and prosecute them. Well, many times that's not the way you get intelligence. I mean, the way you get intelligence is you I'm sure no, is you find people to infiltrate them. You know, you monitor what they're doing. Many times you don't want to arrest them because these people can be your best uh, source of information. And that's been part of the problem at the FBI. They've had this schizophrenia. You know, they have, they're supposed to be doing law enforcement and then they're also here in this country supposed to be doing intelligence. So I think that actually we can do this and do it in a very cost efficient way just by. Uh, not adding people, but just moving the responsibility uh, to, uh, to a different agency. And I would also, I didn't mention this earlier, one of the things that I've been concerned about is also making sure that we're protecting our civil rights and our civil liberties in the process of finding these terrorists and, uh, and protecting ourselves. Uh, I would also, as part of this, set up an office, an independent office of civil rights that was responsible for monitoring what was being done to make sure that uh, uh, civil rights and, and freedoms and privacy uh, were not being violated. And that right now there's a lot that can be done that nobody's, that nobody's responsible for monitoring. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I don't really have much more noise. That's okay, I can hear you fine. I'm concerned about temporary assistance for the family. Um, I'm concerned that single mothers, kids, and parents can't uh, meet the work requirements because they have to take care of their children, they can't afford daycare. I'm concerned that um, once the time limit is up, the three years or five years, we haven't provided these um, folks advance enough skills to actually go out and get a job. How do you feel about that? That's a, a, a problem that you're absolutely right about. Uh, it actually is an example, I think, of where the president is not in touch with real people's lives. The reason I don't think he un I don't think he understands what's happening in the economy is not a, it's not his own life experience, and he does it doesn't. I don't think he thinks in terms of somebody gets laid off for a few weeks, they lose their they could lose their health care, their family loses their health care. The problems that you're describing, um, if you know if, if if we want people to go to work who are capable of going to work, which we do, that's a very good idea. You have to get them the tools to do it. And the tools include, for as you just pointed out, for a single working mom, she's got to have a safe place to put her kids. I mean, my kids have have, uh, uh, have gone to daycare, and I've been through this for many, many years. And I'm telling you, if your kids aren't in a daycare that you feel like they're safe and, and they're doing a good job, it's, it's a frightening <coughs> thing, and it's enormously distracting. But for a single working mom, she has to have some place to put her children. Uh, otherwise, she can't go to work. She needs transportation to get to the job, whatever jobs are available to her. And as you, as you correctly point out, if you don't give her the training that she needs uh, to improve her work skills, then basically she's going to be stuck uh, for the rest of her life working in a minimum wage job. We also should raise the minimum wage, by the way, because uh, we have you know, over three million people in this country working full time and living in poverty. Uh, and I think we have a responsibility to raise the minimum wage. But I, to answer your question, I think that we should get people working. I think that's a very good idea. We're doing the right thing on that front, but we have to make sure we give them the tools to make that transition, and, and, uh, and that includes child care, transportation, training. Um, I think those are part of our responsibilities. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. You've spoken a lot about representing all Americans. Yes. How would you go about bringing the government back to all Americans in a way to move? 
Well, one of the things that I think has happened since September the 11th is it was this great surge of patriotism. We all saw it. It was a good thing. So it was actually a wonderful thing. But I think in many ways we haven't tapped into that. You know, I was talking a few minutes ago about the Homeland Defense. You know, we haven't, most, most, this is just an example, most families would like to do more to protect their own, themselves and their communities, but they haven't been asked to. I mean, I think people would be willing to participate in community organization, determining what needs to be done if a terrorist attack were to occur. Uh, I think there are many ways across the spectrum, from homeland defense uh, to, uh, to volunteering in the schools to, I mean, you could, you could list many things that people would be willing to do, particularly after 911, that we've not asked them to do. Uh, so to answer your question, I think the way to reverse apathy is to ask people to be engaged, to ask them to be involved, to give them more control both over their own lives and their own chance of success and the lives of those around them. And uh, there's an enormous sense of, around the country today, I can tell you I've been all over the place, uh, that people want to participate. But for them to participate, we have to ask them uh, to participate. And there is, you're right about the, the, for your first point too, I mean there is a sense uh, down where, where I come from one of the things that people worry about is that there's this big, massive Washington bureaucracy and they have no control over it and uh, it's hard for their voice to ever get through all that maze of, of, uh, of bureaucracy in Washington. I, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, it is one of the reasons that I think we can uh, uh, make the, the bureaucracy smaller uh, outside of Homeland Defense and outside of, Nash outside of the Defense Department. I think that is something that can be, uh, that can be accomplished. So the, 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 those are my answers. I think, I think the single most important thing, though, is to have people feel like their involvement matters and their participation matters, both for themselves, their family, their community. Uh, if they feel that and they feel like they're actually contributing, uh, that, that in many ways deals with the apathy in the most effective way. Other questions? Anybody? You guys are doing really well so far. Yes, sir. In a race that uh, becomes more crowded every day, a time where I think a lot of Democrats are feeling disheartened about their party and about the voice that they have, what sets you apart and what, what makes you the best candidate, Democratic candidate in this race? Um, several things. First, uh, perspective. You know, I think that what America wants in their president is somebody who sees things through their eyes, understands their problems, that they feel a personal connection with. I think presidential elections are very personal. Uh, and coming from where I come from, having spent my life doing what I've been doing, um, I, I am, uh, uh, I think, in the best suited to uh, to understand people's problems and to be ad an advocate for dealing uh, with those problems. Uh, and also the Democratic Party has to decide, our party has a decision to make. If, if our party wants to move forward, uh, which I believe it should, uh, then I would argue that I'm the best face and voice for doing that. Uh, and so I think it's a combination combination of those two things and also I can win. I can win the election. Yes ma'am. Um, on your website you say you want to commit to developing a national strategy for en energy security to reduce our um, reliance on the Middle East. Yes. How specifically would you do that? Well one way I would do it is um, to uh, change the way we consume um, in this country. Uh, we had in the United States Senate uh, an effort to change uh, fuel efficiency standards for automobiles. Uh, it was a fairly modest thing. Uh, and we not only were defeated in trying to improve fuel efficiency for automobiles, but we uh, had, a, had a lot of Democrats that didn't vote with us. Uh, and I think it was because there was a lot of external pressures uh, from the car companies, from uh, some of the automaker unions. Um, and I think, I think if we, 
as Democrats, speaking for myself as a Democrat, and as a nation, want to move forward. We have to find, that's one example, we have to find ways uh, to become more energy independent. Uh, we need to find cleaner, more efficient, alternative sources of energy uh, to the extent we're using uh, uh, fossil fuels. We need to reduce our dependence on them because this change in fuel efficiency standards would help to help to achieve. Because it, I would say to, to folks in this country, it is not just an environmental issue. It's really a national security issue now. I mean, developing that kind of independence that allows us to do what's in our best interest without being so heavily dependent on our relationships with Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, in that, you know, in many ways drives our policy in that part of the world, which is one of the hottest, most dangerous parts of the world. Um, I mean, we need to be at the place that we can make independent judgments about what's in the best interest of the American people as opposed to uh, being, having to make decisions knowing how, how desperately we need their oil. So those are those are some of the things that I would do. Yes, ma'am. Earlier you stated that you were for uh, campaign finance reform. Can yes. you just elaborate a little bit how you feel like the impact of, of the campaign like that? Well, I I uh, I was involved. Uh, Senator McCain and Senator Feingold led the fight on the McCain Feingold campaign finance reform. I, I helped them with that. Um, and there were a number of us who helped them. Uh, and I think it was a move in the right direction, but I think the truth of the matter is um, it's very hard to solve our campaign finance, to deal with our campaign finance in this system, this system in this country, unless we're do it, willing to do something more dramatic. You know, as long as we, as long as money is in politics the way it is today, the politicians are going to, including myself, are going to spend an enormous amount of our time raising money. Uh, it's distracting from trying to focus on substantive issues and things that affect your lives. Uh, and it creates a perception with the public that, uh, that all you care about are the people who give you money. Uh, and so there are multiple problems. First, it takes a lot of time to do it. Second, it creates a perception in, in the general public that, and we were talking earlier about our voice being heard, you know, regular folks' voice being heard. I think that's part of the problem. People think. You know, the only people that the president and others are going to pay any attention to are the people who give them money. So to answer your question specifically, what I would do is I would go to a combination of public financing and requiring broadcasters to provide, broadcasters meaning television and radio, uh, to provide uh, some free airtime. Because I think until we get, literally, get money out of politics, um, it's not, I think what we've done so far <coughs> is it's a good positive signal for the American people. It shows that we want to clean things up. We got rid of what's called soft money and the big checks that anybody could write. But that, that, that's not enough. That, that will not solve the problem. Uh, I know because I'm out there having to raise money myself right now, as all the presidential candidates are. And you spend an enormous amount of your time doing it. Yes? As your witness, Senator, Social Security is also a big issue day. In fact, a lot of seniors rely on Social Security to help pay their way for the rest of their lives. Um, just out of curiosity, what's your stance on Social Security and other things you feel need to be made in the system? I think the single most important thing to do with Social Security is to get the, operate the government in a responsible way, which means we quit spending Social Security money for things that have nothing to do with Social Security. Basically, if you understand the flow of money for Social Security purposes, uh, what's happening is people who are paying their Social Security taxes now are paying the benefits of those who are getting benefits now. And there's a, there's, at this moment, there's a surplus in that revenue. In other words, there's more money coming in than it's going out to benefits. That's going to shift dramatically over the next few years as the baby boomers come of age and, and retire. So. Uh, what, and what's happening now is when you hear the president talking about and reading the newspaper that the president's going, putting us deeper and deeper into deficit, that's where that money comes from. Uh, the, only, the only way to make up the deficit, the only place the money can come from is from the, uh, the flow of funds from Social Security taxes, payroll taxes. So what I think the most important thing to do to lengthen the financial viability of, of Social Security is to operate the government in a responsible way, quit borrowing from Social Security. Uh, if we do so, for example, I, my, one of my ideas is to stop the tax cut for 
uh, the top one to two percent is scheduled to go into effect in 2004. That saves about one and a half trillion dollars over the next 20 years, um, and has a significant impact on life of Social Security. So I think that's the starting place. I think that's the single, uh, single most important thing to do at that point. And it also gives us time to, to uh, craft other solutions. You're welcome. Well, on behalf of San Antonio College, we'd like to thank you for, for coming in and speaking with us today. Thank you. Th is this my present? It is. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, guys. See, no, thank you. Oh, no, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Good to see you. Appreciate your question. Yeah. No, thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. Really nice to see you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You guys need to get involved. You're talking to the involvement. Not a bit. Not a bit.